I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Leon. Thank you, Leon. So uh, good evening, everyone. And it's actually uh, Leon and Howard. Um, we are uh, following up on a TNT forum that we did a few weeks ago, kind of backed by popular demand. But before I get started, Bill mentioned about um, Mark Twain, and it made me chuckle because um, as, uh, once upon a time I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. Has anybody here lived in Cincinnati? Lucky you. So you know what Mark Twain said about living in Cincinnati, or what he said about Cincinnati? He said, if the world comes to an end, I'm moving to Cincinnati because it won't happen there for at least 20 years. <laughs> 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 and he's right. <laughs> so anyway, my little start to the meeting. All right, so as I said, uh, this uh, presentation we're giving this evening is a follow-up to a TNT forum where we just simply had a request for more information. So uh, what Howard and I are going to talk about tonight is portable antennas, antennas that you can throw in the back of your car or put in a backpack and take to the field and um, use effectively. And uh, we're just going to give a little bit of our experience with planning before you go, um, how we've analyzed the performance of our antennas and how we've set them up and that sort of thing. And... Um, one of the things that we like to ask for before we get started is uh, for your input during this discussion because a lot of you have experience with this as well. So if you have things to add or uh, you want to ask questions or, or whatever, uh, I think we'd like for this to be a, a, an interactive discussion. So um, do you want to take them through the outline of the presentation then? And um Yeah, we can, we can uh, start here just uh, as listed here before you head out, stuff you need to plan for. Uh, uh, antenna analysis. It's good. Yeah, it's a good idea that we. Um, yeah, a good idea to uh, kind of know what the characteristics are, you know, kind of thing. And and we did some of that uh, limited basis. We'll have some uh, examples about. There's three of them listed there. There there are a whole lot more, of course, but we just kind of picked those. And. Uh, <coughs> We'll mention the Elecraft uh, KX2 and the AX1, which I happen to have set up here, and then also work on the KX3. There's another super antenna, which I didn't, we didn't set up, and then uh, maybe a few comments on homebrew stuff. So the, f the focus today is to on, on stuff you can carry to the field, one way or the other. <coughs> I like the idea of being able to take something and backpack or you may want to throw it in the back of your car, or uh, uh, something fairly light and simple, again, depending on what you really want to do. One of the key uh, successes, I think, is pre-planning. So you know kind of what your antenna is going to do or have a good idea beforehand. And uh, so you won't r hopefully you'll get uh, a lot better results. Typically, we want you know something that's lightweight, Easy to set up, decent performance, whatever that means, but understand that the trade-offs, depending on what you want to do, like hiking, camping, traveling, de will depend a lot on what kind of an antenna you're able to take along. So uh, we like to you know, thoroughly analyze the antenna if you have a chance prior to departure so you know what works. You know, if you got a, a long wire, a, a loop, <coughs> a, uh, uh, there's a number of other types of portable antennas that you can set up in one way or another. So have a good idea, you know, how it sets up and what it's going to do. Uh, one of the things that uh, Leon has done and I've done to some extent is for the buddy pole is to, uh, is to uh, uh, record the key parameters so it's easier to set and use in the field. The buddy pole can be, as Leon can tell you in a little bit, they, uh, there's quite a few moving parts to that thing that can help us to know where to start. So um, another good thing to have is, is, is equipment list, you know, connectors, cables, supports, that kind of thing, and then have something that you can pack for easy transport. You want to show them your bag just to give an example? I think this is a great example of something that's easy to transport. Yeah, this I built around originally around the KX3, and then I then got a KX2. So what I fit in here, and part of it is sitting right here, a transceiver, <coughs> a roll-up wire antenna, which is a 41-foot LNR, uh, they call it a trail-friendly antenna, 
then Ellicraft came out with this telescoping whip that clips on to the end, which is good for 20 meters, 17 meters, and you can make it work on, on 15 meters as well. And along with the mic, and I've got a, uh, a six amp hour lithium battery and some other miscellaneous stuff. And it all fits in this little case. So I like the idea of being able to sling it over your shoulder and go to the field. Depends again on you know transmit and listen. The uh, the KX2 has got a, a little over two amp hour battery, so you combine that with with this one. And I've not really ever run it out. To, to, you know, you could probably run half a day or longer, maybe all day, depending on how much transmitting you do at five watts. That it'll it'll go quite a while, I think. Any other questions? So one of the things that I'll mention here that I think is really important in this whole pre, uh, pre-planning business is you know, not only do you want to know how your antenna behaves, but I've been caught out on a couple of times when I've gotten out into the field and I'm missing a key connector. And the way I've figured out how to do that is I now keep everything together um, for my little go bag. And uh, I also have a little inventory, a little list, so that I can just kind of tick through it before I go. And that um, makes it so that if I get up to the top of a big tall hill and I want to pull my gear out and, and I have that BNC to whatever connector that I need and it's not in the bag, I, you know, I don't face that situation, which has happened to me, by the way. So um, it, it just to try to protect yourself yeah. and make sure that you can operate. One of the ways I, you know, I try to deal with that same problem is to set everything up beforehand, you know, connect it up, see that it works. And you know, and then then fold it all back up and put it back in a bag. Because Leon's right, I've been to Colorado a few times, and if you're climbing, hiking a 14er or someplace, it's, <laughs> it's pretty hard to go find a you know connector, a piece of coax, or whatever at that point. So, to me, part of the key to that is setting it up, checking it out, and make sure it works. You know. So, so the, the work that we've done, or at least that I like to do to, to make sure that uh, everything's working is I'll use an antenna analyzer. And um, as Howard already mentioned, I'll set up the antenna and um, measure all the performance parameters that I'm interested in. I've just uh, grabbed a picture here uh, to show uh, you know, that there's a broad range of antenna analyzers that are available. Um, one of the antenna, an antenna analyzer that I have that is not, I don't take it I- anywhere portable, but uh, I like this one a lot. It's called the uh, AIM 4170. It's, it's an antenna vector analyzer that's available from Array Solutions. And the thing that I like about it is that um, it interfaces with my laptop computer and um, you can set it up so that um, you can scan a very broad range of antenna performance parameters. And um, in, th- in this case, I, I've just simply shown SWR, but it measures rho, it measures um, reactance, it measures all kinds of different um, endpoints that you can use to truly characterize um, your antenna. But in this, c- and, and the other thing that I like about it is, is that you can scan across the, uh, a band of your choosing. In this case, the scan runs from, I think this is from 40 meters all the way up to 10 meters. And then the, the graphics is set up um, so that there are, uh, there's a gray band that indicates the width of each of the amateur radio bands. So you can measure the SWR across this. It sweeps across the band, and then um, it, it, it makes a picture uh, of the scan so that you can see the S, uh, what the SWR is. And then on these graphs that I'm about to show you, uh, this uh, top uh, red dotted line is SWR equal to 2, and uh, the lower red dotted line is SWR equal to 1. And so you can see where, where the SWR is less than 2, and uh, you can see uh, the bandwidth across which um, I- it's below that, um, that uh, uh, 2.0. So anyway, it's a very flexible analyzer. The other thing, the last thing that I, I really like about it is that I can save the files. And so, like for example, if I measure the antenna performance uh, of an antenna that, that I have outside, I can keep track of it over time. And if something goes wrong with a feed line or, you know, I have a, a water leak or something like that, um, I can compare today's measurement with previous measurements to see, to see what's going on. So I find it a very, very useful analyzer for characterizing antennas, building them, and then keeping track of, of how the antennas are behaving. And then another thing that's really handy is to, to have something that's small. Uh, this happens to be uh, uh, a little small portable an- analyzer that I can carry with me in, in a backpack. This one's made by MFJ. 
Um, they're pretty good as well. The, the thing that's nice about this one is that it has a color display on it, and again, it shows a sweep, and you can see um, at a glance how your antenna is performing as you set it up in the field and, and use it to correct problems and so forth. So these are really nice to have in your backpack. Um, Howard's been looking at one that's, uh, there, there's other ones that are made by yeah. other companies. One there's of uh, one made by uh, Step IR, I think. It's very similar in shape, but I think it's got a slightly bigger display. And I've been looking at that as a backpack type of thing to take to the field. Uh, but like I said, there are others, and there are a number of different ones out if you look around. So it's a matter of uh, how much you want to put into it, I think. Yeah. So uh, these are the three antennas that we're going to discuss today. Um, I have a buddy pole. Um, it's out, out in the car. We have decided not to bring it in and set it up unless somebody's interested. I'm, I'm happy to bring it in after the the meeting or at any time otherwise but anyway it's a modular antenna system that um, uh, is available from this company uh, they're, they're located out in uh, out on the west coast and they the, the it's a nice antenna it's a little bit pricey but it's like I said it's very modular easy to put in a backpack it's a little bit heavy um, for backpacking per se so where I use it mostly is to throw it in the back of the car and if I'm out at a park or if we're out camping or something like that it's really easy to set up and as you'll see it performs pretty well and then uh, Howard's going to discuss the other two antennas okay the one in the top left is the loop it's an uh, Alex loop that I got some time ago, and uh, uh, but it's very lightweight and uh, uh, relatively easy to set up. I made a homemade uh, support for it out of PVC pipe, which we didn't show here, but uh, and, and I think it works fairly well. The problem with loops and loop in general, and I think Lee <laughs> could probably add to that a little bit, is their their high Q and very narrow, very sharp tuning. So the the big problem, if you want to call it that, with this one is is tuning it. And the box on the bottom has a knob there that you adjust. And basically, I found that if you uh, tune for maximum noise on the transceiver, and then you could probably tweak it a little bit after that. But it takes a little tweaking to get the SWR really low, and it's very very narrow, as I said. Other, you know, but it works, and uh, you can get out. Uh, with the thing and it's very lightweight. Again, the trade-off is it's lightweight and relatively easy to set up. The other uh, antenna right below is a uh, L, excuse me, LNR, uh, they call it, it's a 41 foot uh, long wire. I think it has a, a coil in uh, two thirds down the length of it, but it rolls up really small. This is what it looks like. And it fits in this back, this uh, case I have very well. And I've used this a number of times, and even though it's short, uh, it's got a, a, a transformer on the end of it, and it only handles about 20 watts or 30 watts, somewhere in that area. But it does work, and you know, it gets out, depends again, like any long wire, kind of how you deploy it. So, uh, but <coughs> again, that all goes toward portability and ease of use. Yeah, so I'll just comment, when we set it up and tested it the other day when we were preparing for this presentation, uh, we just, um, I, w I just had a little sack of lead and uh, we used it to uh, hoik it up in, in the tree um, and then we, uh, we'll see the, the SWR measurements that we made and um, you know, it was pulling in good signals whenever we were lift, uh, listening and, and I think Howard's had really great experience with it. So it's pretty easy to set up and, um, and get going. So um, what I'm going to talk about now is the buddy pole, um, the setup that I use. So again, the buddy pole is this um, uh, uh, modular system that you could put together. The, the it comes with arm links that uh, screw together end to end. There's a T in the middle that connects to a, a ballon in the center, and, and that takes it out to the feed line. And um, I'll, I'll show you a table in just a second that um, shows the, the length of the arms that I used. And um, in the testing that I did, I pushed the antenna up to about 25 feet above the ground on this little tripod system that I have. And then I created the uh, SWR charts using the, this, um, this is the AIM 470 here. I didn't show it, but this is, this is the analyzer I mentioned a minute ago. And um, it, uh, it'll give you a sense for uh, how, how this antenna uh, tunes on the different bands, uh, depending on how it's set up. And um, again, if you're interested in the buddy pole and how it works, you can go online. And um, there's an article called The Buddy Pole in the Field by um, 
a guy named Scott Anderson. His call sign is N N1ERD, which I think is pretty cool. But uh, anyway, old N1Nerd has uh, done a, written a really nice summary of um, how to set up and operate the buddy pole. So it's a little bit more information if you're interested. So um, the buddy pole, the way it's set up, is, is kind of an off-center fed dipole. And um, they, um, uh, and, and you'll see how well it works, uh, depending on the coil setup, the length of the arms, and then on the very end, there's uh, telescopic whips that you can adjust to different lengths uh, in order to tune the antenna. So <coughs> if you start down at 10, t and, and then there's, um, it's all color coded, so uh, uh, red and black side, there's a, a red a coil and a black coil, and uh, using the table like this, you can assemble the antenna to um, operate on whatever band you're interested in. So this is the, the before you go work that Howard and I were talking about. So what I did is I set up my buddy pole as I just described, and uh, I made these measurements so that, and then recorded the, um, the number of arms that I, I put. If I used a coil, where did I tap the coil? Um, if I extended the whip, how long did I extend the whip so that um, when I got out to the field, uh, m this table, I have it um, uh, in, uh, incorporated into one of these laminated sheets so that it's waterproof and it's in my bag. So when I get to the place that I'm going, I pull the sheet out. And if I want to operate on 15 meters, um, I'll just use the parameters that, that are there. So I'll use one arm uh, on the red coil side and I'll pull out the whip to uh, six sections out without a coil. And then on the right-hand side, I use one arm and uh, um, a six, whip, uh, uh, six uh, uh, sections of the whip pulled out. So it, it's basically a, 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 a dipole that operates on 15 meters. So anyway, the point is, is that I have this table. It's mounted in a laminated card in my bag so that when I want to set it up, um, I can set it up and I can, I, I can reproduce the setup every time I get out. So, and that work was all done before I left. So I didn't have to mess, I don't have to mess around with this when I get in the field. Yes, sir. At the bottom of the website is the directions on how to build your own buddy pole. I did that and it's about $50. It's all PVC pipe, and uh, yeah, and so I did email back and forth, buddy having asking questions about his pole. And what I thought was interesting, it's not symmetric in the extension, so it's an off-center dipole, but he had no explanation at all as to why it worked. He just said, it works, uh -huh. that's good. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, uh, oh, sorry, here we go, yeah. Well, I don't necessarily have a buddy pole, one of the things that I do, because I use this as, as a setup at home, and I also use it for portable, is you, you buy a couple of these uh, single band HF whips, and they actually make a, a device where you a, a, a bracket, where you actually have a coax into this bracket. One goes and insulates to one of the three, the quarter inch threads in which you can put one whip into, and the ground goes into the other whip, and it forms a dipole. And that antenna actually works pretty darn good. I use it from home, and I also use it use it for field day one year. Yeah, and uh, it's only one band though. It's the only catch. Each whip has to be the same <laughs> band. Yeah, and that's one of the things we're going to touch on at the end of our presentation is that, um, and we will acknowledge that there's um, a lot of opportunity to homebrew antennas as well. We're just talking about the buddy pole here because I have one, and and he has his antennas, but. Uh, we don't. We also want to acknowledge, and we don't want to ignore the fact that there are um, homebrew options available for all this, which just adds to the fun of this whole thing. Okay. So anyway, how does this buddy pole work? Um, so what this shows is this shows a scan, an uh, NSWR scan of the uh, uh, of the antenna, like I showed you before, uh, as for the antenna that's set up for 10 meters. And in, in this case, it's a quarter wave dipole, equal ends uh, on each side. And you can see the scan here shows that um, well across the uh, 10 meter band, um, SWR is is less than. Um, uh, is less than two, so it tunes up really well. I don't uh, ever, if I touch the tuner, it, it, it's not even necessary to um, to load the radio. I'm just going to walk quickly through the other bands. This uh, uh, goes down to, this is a 12 meter scan, so you can see it loads real well on 12 when it's set up. Uh, this is, I'll get up here so I can read the numbers. That looks like, uh, uh, what is that, um, 
well, 15 meters, and then, uh, what was that again, 17, and then down to, uh, to 20 meters, it loads really nicely there. And then uh, this is 30 meters, um, so y you begin to ask a, a whole lot of an antenna, and the laws of physics really conspire against you. So you can see that uh, you can tune it up uh, on, on 30 meters, and then uh, let's see, it, that's at 40, so it tunes in the in the 40 meter band as well. But the width of the um, uh, where where that SWR is less than two is is pretty narrow. And there's also, uh, you can buy an 80 meter can that you can screw onto the antenna to uh, load it on 80 meters. And I haven't even bothered with that because, again, I, it's challenging the laws of physics too much in my mind. But anyway, you can load it and, and you can make it work if, if you want to. So, so that's, that's how the, the buddy pole performs. So um, you can set it up and, and get it to load pretty nicely across all the bands. So any questions at all about that? Okay, so my overall impression. So oh, sorry. All again and give like dimensions. So uh, backing up here. So the um, I, I, I have it out in the car and I can bring it in. But the uh, so here's here's the picture of the buddy pole here. Um, the buddy pole has um, the th these arms here are 22 inches long. There's a coil here, and then you can add additional. Uh, yeah, and and the whips are nine and a half feet, and you just adjust the length by um, by s by pulling out the uh, the whips by uh, th the number of segments that I've indicated on this table. And, and you can tap the coils as well. And so again, I didn't get into the details here, but uh, you can see with I, I have the the um, where where I use a coil. Uh, there's a tap position here. So uh, and th there's a wire that you can tap. You just count the rings. And in this case, on the uh, red coil side, to, to work on 40 meters, you tap the coil at, um, uh, tap tw at, at uh, uh, band 25. You pull six sections out on the uh, whip, and you, you, uh, you include two of these 22-inch segments. So that's how you build one side of the antenna. And then you build the other side of the antenna, again, with two arms. The whip is pulled out six sections, and um, you tune 24 inches from the... Uh, uh, or the, 20, the run ring 24 of the um, of the coil, and and part of the reason I don't have the actual links on here is that I don't have to carry a tape measure with me and measure it. I just know how many sections I need to pull out, and and I know that it's going to work. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> that table that you had, did you make that table, or is that the buddy pull table? That's my table. I made that table. Um, Based and and I you know I use uh, these measurements to to make that table. And that's again that's what we're talking about is setting up the antenna, making the measurements, finding out what works, record it, and put it in a format you can take to the field with you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so let's rock through this and. Uh, so my overall impression of the antenna, it's pretty easy to tune, 10 through 20 meters. Gets more difficult at 30 and 40. And uh, my experience in using it is it works really well in the field um, on those bands. So um, now, Howard, oh, you want to? Yeah, I could talk a little bit about the infed. <coughs> it's uh, <coughs> the way we had it set up, as, as Leon indicated, was <coughs> just the end thrown up over a tree branch about 15 feet up. So it was kind of a sloping type setup and not unlike what you might do out in the, in the field or on a hike or out in the woods or whatever and so <coughs> we went through uh, each of the different bands this one is on uh, it's supposed to operate basically uh, seven through uh, 40 meters through 10 meters and so you can see as we swept across there it uh, <coughs> it did that more or less there were a few places that really didn't do that well but the uh, tuner in the radio usually took care of the problem but uh, again it's a, a trade-off or a compromise type situation but uh, given uh, given what we got it you know it didn't seem to do too bad and my experience with using it is it seems to work fairly well for a short for a short antenna for a short long wire so to speak so <coughs> So just so everybody's oriented, this is 40 meters here. So there's a there's a dip here. Uh, this is 20 meters, and uh, this is 10 meters here. Um, 
and you can count the bands between, so 12, 15, 17, 20, 30, and 40. So it, ten it tends to work better on the, on the you know, 7 meters, uh, 20 meters, uh, and actually 10 meters, you know. So, and it's close on a couple of the others, but, but not all that good. And I think if you played around with it, you could probably improve it a little bit. Okay. Overall impression is that uh, it's acceptable SWR 40, 20, and 10. And the tuner can usually handle a mismatch on the other bands if you want to try to operate on those. Counterpoise with that? No. No counterpoise. It's got a uh, transformer on the end of it. So uh, that usually negates the need to put a counterpoise. Although I haven't tried it, we might do that one of these times. Yeah. <coughs> the Alex loop is a totally different kind of antenna. It's very lightweight and very s relatively small, relatively easy to set up. But the big trade-off with the Alex loop is it's extremely sharp tuning. And uh, the way we usually approach it is to uh, <laughs> tune in the band, tune the knob for maximum noise, try to get that as close as possible. And then when we hooked up the analyzer, we found it was really touchy to uh, to get it. So in some cases, we weren't able to get the uh, SWR down that, that far. I think if we spent a little more time, we probably could have got a little better SWR out. But again, you see how sharp and narrow that is. Next. 12 meters is similar. You see the SWRs are fairly high. Uh, same kind of problem as we go through the rest of them. Um, keep going. Uh, 20 meters, it gets down to two, to, uh, down to two, and uh, 30 meters is again kind of high, and the next one, 40 meters, surprisingly enough, we're able to get down to two. So again, it's a matter of how much you want to play with it. One of the things I wish I had was a remote tuning. Some of the loops out there, I think Bob uh, REX has got one, and some others that Sorry, uh, I don't mean to be in your way here. that. Uh, <coughs> that have it, you know, you can get a remote tuning, which makes it a little bit easier, and it would help if there was a, a vernier on there, so it would make the tuning rate slower. I think that would be a, a big help to kind of zoom in on the, on the, on the best spot. But uh, it does work, it's lightweight, and uh, you know, it's like everything else, it's a trade-off. Yes? The one comment, the high visual you're getting is, Probably a function of the coupling. The, the high visoir minimum you're getting is really a function of that coupling loop. And if you move that secondary loop a little bit, you can probably bring that thing down to one and a half to one or something or less. Okay. So it's just, you know, the, the, it's not the primary loop that's causing that visoir issue. It's, it's really the coupling loop. So how do you how do you move it? So do you do you, so you have to adjust the move move it you know up or down a little bit okay. away. So if you move that loop, you you will you know change the B point and P and so a little bit coupling into the loop to get the thing closer to 50 ohms. Okay. One other thing that might have come in with those graphs is a measurement issue, because the bandwidth is so narrow on a loop. The step in your VNA, depending on what, how how far it's stepping, it may not be hitting the bottom of your of your uh, your measured VSCR. It might be like aliasing basically across the measurement. We, we, and we can adjust that to test yeah, it so some more. Yeah, up, yeah, right? yeah, we can do that. Result. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that shows you some of the peculiar. Those are good ideas, and and the Alex loop might be a little hard to adjust that coupling loop, but we, that's certainly something to play with, and Bob's got a good point here about the uh, the actual measurement itself. So we didn't uh, have a whole lot of time. It was kind of <laughs> chilly out there, mm -hmm. so we we got a rough cut at it, And but I think the general characteristic that we see is is that they're sharp, and the tuning is, is more difficult than a lot of the other antennas, but if you're willing to fiddle with them, I think you can uh, make it reasonably acceptable, whatever that is. Here's a couple more antennas. So one of them I have actually set up here, the KX2 and Elecraft's new 
portable antenna, the AX1, and it's uh, it's got an extendable whip, as you see, and a coil with a switch on it, and it's designed for 20 meters, what, 17 meters, and it'll work on 15 meters, too, as well. And uh, it does work, got out with it, and uh, in fact, Harry said he tried it here a while back and made some contacts across country and didn't even have the counterpoise hooked up. It, it comes with a 13-foot wire that you plug in, which does make a significant difference, I think. So, again, I like the idea of the portability, and uh, depending on where you are, I think uh, it can do a lot. The other is a, uh, called a super antenna, which is basically a coil with a, a, a extendable whip that you can adjust up and down, and, uh, and it has a bunch of radials that go with it. So it's basically a small uh, vertical, I think, with an adjustable coil. And we didn't have time to really characterize that one, but that may be a feature thing that we try to do. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Summary-wise, <coughs> well, pros are these things are lightweight, portable, relatively easy to carry, except the buddy pole, and easy to deploy. So they work good enough when operating away from an optimized base station, I think. And, you know, damn near anything will radiate if you get it out there. This will uh, uh, work, I think, uh, given the portability issue. The cons, of course, are performance is not as good as a full-size fixed antenna. They're power limited. Uh, some of them are power limited. The, the loop will only take about 15 or 20 watts, and some of the others are limited as well. And they're often harder to tune. As, as we've demonstrated here. Okay, and that's uh, that's our presentation. So uh, questions, and let's um, I'll, I'll grab the microphone here and get it over here. Uh, not really a question, but uh, I have one of the rig expert. I think it's uh, AA30. Uh, anyway, it's the 30 model, and uh, I've only had it a couple of years, but it has a USB connection and software with it, so you can do that graphing and all yeah. with it, and that. Saving it, just as you mentioned, is really handy because then when you go and you make a change and you bump it up five feet and you realize now it's shifted 50 kilohertz, you know, um, it's very good to be able to look back and see what yeah. it was before. And then you can uh, also see how the uh, changing the height has uh, adjusted the minimum SWR. Yeah. yeah. I want to make one comment about that. Mm. Um, the Visward return loss does not tell you how well your antenna is working in terms of where it's putting out the hour energy. Remember, remember the, the best, flattest antenna with a 50 ohms across the board you can get is a resistor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so one of the items, I think, with the loop, and, and the, I forgot who in the club's got one, but I know somebody built one. I don't know if it's uh, out of like half-inch quarter pipe. I can't, I don't know if it's, I can't remember who it was. They brought, yeah. yeah. So anyway, the one problem with small antennas is the lossiness. And like the loop antennas, you know, the larger you can use your cable, piping, whatever, to make your primary loop, the lower your losses are going to be and the more efficient it's going to be as an antenna. Um, so that's, I know there are a lot of loops out there. Um, the other thing to watch out for, in addition to being very sharp tuning, uh, if you're running any power in them, they can have very high voltage and current spots in that loop. And if you put 100 watts into that loop antenna, you can have well over 1,000 volts across the capacitor. So, Yeah, it might go bang. So, and, and Howard did mention that, that there are power limits on that, so it's good that you've reiterated that. So. Um, any other comments or questions or observations? Harry, uh, let me bring the microphone around here. It's a question for you. Do you have a, a buddy stick, the vertical, the buddy pole vertical? All of this can be reconfigured. I showed the dipole, but it can be refigured um, into a stick and used in that configuration with a counterpoise. And I have all the measurements for that as well, but I didn't bring them because okay. it would be too much to cover. But I, I've created the same table for the vertical configuration, which is the buddy stick configuration as compared to the dipole. So I'd be happy to talk that with you if you want. Other questions, comments, any other Observation, Yasek, let me come around here to our camera operator. 
<laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is comment from Dennis watching remotely. He said that MFJ has uh, ham sticks which can handle 600 watts. Okay, which, which uh, what are they called again? Ham sticks, okay. In fact, I think I got an ad from MFJ tonight just before I came over here about those sticks. Yeah. But you could probably make a dipole out of it as, uh, as, as Kevin was saying, yeah. I have one, but I've never used it. I was just going to add that you're probably not going to be using 600 watts in the field oh, no. just because <laughs> your batteries true. will last about a minute. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's we're right. we're like usually talking five watts. So. I keep, mm -hmm. uh, you know, five to ten watts. I can, you, can, you can get ten watts out of the KX2 or 3. And of course, your battery life goes down accordingly. But, again, it's a, it's a trade-off. I, I look at it, and I think the points that Lee mentioned about uh, some adjustments and efficiency are all, you know, very valid. The question is how big how much you want to lug around and how much do you really want to do. So... <coughs> I really like, <coughs> of all these, I really like the uh, the, the long wire probably the best uh, so far. But uh, I wanted to try the others out, see how they worked. Yeah, I think. Another comment from Dennis. He says he worked uh, the eggs and all over the world, and he's using them with 18 feet uh, uh, MJ Trump tripod. Yeah, so it's very similar to the very similar to the buddy pole. So, um, Jack, did you want to say something? Yeah, thanks. So, comments on on the loop and on the uh, uh, NFED. So, on the loop, uh, I have a chameleon loop, which is similar to the Alex loop. Um, at the top of the loop, I don't know if it's the same. Is there a, a Velcro that holds the feed loop to the big uh, coax loop? to the top that's why it's a little hard to move okay but i'm going to try that based on you know what lee's talking about so the other thing i found that matters a lot is how co-planner they are if that loop twists out of the plane uh you don't get good coupling and then your visor shoots up and that makes a that's a big deal as well and with one point where it's attached i'd suggest maybe putting on maybe two side pieces of tape or something that helps keep it in a plane so I read through the documentation from the manufacturer about the efficiency of it, and it said relative to a dipole, you can expect it to be down one or two S units, which is kind of a big range, right? That's six or 12 decibels versus a dipole. So that's a considerable amount. And operating from the field, I can tell you that when you've you got five watts going in, going down to half a watt effectively output really is a big hit versus the end fed, which is not that far from a dipole in terms of efficiency. So the, uh, the end fed that you have, you, it was originally marketed, I think, uh, by Dale Parfit um, as uh, his end fed. And it's weird that it doesn't have a counterpoise because it's gotta be there somewhere, right? Mm. So it has a broad matching transformer at the base. Probably a coax to some extent is, is the counterpoise, but I've never gotten RF back on it as far as I know, and they claim you don't. Uh, and I can tell you, it, it works really well. Um, you're supposed to tune it when you get it. The, to get it to sit where you want within 10, uh, within, uh, 10 meters, because it's a broad spectrum, you have to trim the end of it. Uh, there's a, a, a trap at the end. Yeah. Um, and it'll work uh, very well on, on 40, 20, and 10. The other secret of it is, if you take the wire off, you can put any wire on as long as it's a half wavelength. So if you want a 17 meter antenna, you can use that same broad matching transformer and it'll work, I think, six through like 80. Uh, so if you want to carry some extra wire with you, unfortunately, you've got to get it up in a tree. But in terms of weight and efficiency, I, I love that little antenna. Yeah. Great, thanks, Those are that's really helpful feedback. Any, any other comments, uh, questions? All right, with that, um, I'll say thanks to the very kind audience and uh, turn it back to uh, President Bill. Well, thanks to Howard and to Leon for that presentation. If you have any questions, I'm sure they're going to be happy to answer them.
Um, I have a one announcement to make, and that is I just want to remind everyone to be careful tomorrow in the snow. And also, keep your radios up and going. Who knows? You might be able to help somebody out. You never know. Uh, and Brendan has an announcement as well. So more of a question to add to our survey theory uh, th theme here. Um, does anybody in the club happen to live in Falls Church or in the Falls Church area? Would one of you five with your hand raised be willing to take ownership for a short time of one of our club members' radios and then get it to them? Bill Schultz, W3HXF. I've had his DMR radio for some time, and it's now been programmed for him, and I'm looking for a way to get it back to him without me driving to Falls Church. You got it? Okay, thanks guys, appreciate it. All right, well thanks to everyone for being here. We, this is a great showing. My challenge to the club is uh, can we beat this crowd for the next meeting, which is two weeks from tonight. Two weeks from tonight, great show coming up. Uh, UDX, are you here, still here? KM4 UDX. Drones, is that what we're gonna talk about? We'd be flying high without the use of any chemicals. And uh, have you repaired all, all the propellers on that thing? Okay. We won't talk about that. Yeah, I've, I've already destroyed the video. Don't worry. No one will see it. Okay, anyhow, thanks, everyone, for being here. Have a great evening. Again, be careful in the snow tomorrow. Come over to Pete's house and have some pizza. Don't forget to clean up, please. We need to leave this place. 